Hello and welcome to the continuation of the Repair Marathon. This time I'm going to take a closer look at this 486 mainboard model MB4D33-50. This mainboard was made by Aquarius Systems and I guess 33 and 50 in the name is because this mainboard was originally delivered with 33 or 50 MHz CPUs? Question mark? But I might be wrong, because it has a variable clock generator, which is capable to generate frequencies up to 100 MHz. So actually this mainboard is not limited to 33 or 50 MHz CPUs. As you see from the text on the silk layer, this mainboard supports a lot of FSB frequencies for up to 50 MHz. Maybe there was another version which came with clock generator for up to 33 MHz? Who knows? Well, let's see what's wrong with it. This mainboard has some damage from a leaky battery, which was partially treated, but there are still some corners which should be cleaned more properly. If you remember, I got this mainboard for this repair marathon from Ulf from Dotreloaded the e-community. He said that this mainboard is actually posting, but the keyboard is dead. He replaced the connector, but it didn't help. By the way, I am trying to repair all this mainboard simultaneously in one weekend, so for me it is a real repair marathon. However, it almost takes more time to cut the videos than the repair itself. That's why the videos will pop up uh, one after another with some delay in between. And sometimes you will see one of the other mainboard from this marathon in the picture as well, even if it is about another one. Okay, as I told, I have to make some more extensive cleanup of the oxidation. Therefore, some parts have to be removed. I already desoldered the power and the keyboard connectors. Fortunately, there are not many parts which are affected. But here you can see the damage quite well. I just had to add some white vinegar and scrub the mainboard with a brush to get it quite shiny again. Also on the back, most of the oxide was cleaned up quite good. Now I have to wash the mainboard, but before that I have to remove the CPU and the cooler. This mainboard uses a low insertion force socket. To get the CPU out of it, just put a wide flat head screwdriver between the socket and the CPU and rotate it gently. But don't apply too much force or you could break the ceramic CPU body. By the way, the CPU is an AMD 486DX2 with 80 MHz. It has a front side bus of 40 MHz and is designed for 5 volt supply. It is quite rare, since such relatively late 486 CPUs were usually made for 3 volts and were not feasible for an upgrade on an older mainboard, which provides only 5 volts, obviously, like this one. And since this mainboard supports up to 50 MHz frontside bus, this could be a nice opportunity for overclocking. In case this mainboard will hold it stable, this will end up in pretty fast 486 build. However, since uh, VLB is directly connected to the CPU, it runs with the same frontside bus and usually starts to be very peaky with frequencies above 33 MHz. So the main board has to be very good to keep it stable at 50 MHz. Back to the topic. Time to wash the main board. Just water and soap. And as always, don't forget to wash everything with a lot of clean water afterwards and give enough time to dry in a warm, dry place for about 24 hours. After the board got dry, I removed the rest of oxide and burst solder mask from the PCB using fine polishing tool. There are some residues of the old solder, so I remove it using a solder wick. And again, clean the traces with a Dremel on the back side of the PCB. Now the traces are clean and shiny again. I cleaned the surface with some IPA already and now I add a layer of flux to thin the traces. Due to oxidation neutralization with white vinegar and final polishing, the traces lost some strength. Tinning them, we can restore the thickness and protect the copper from further oxidation. Tinning is easier than many people think. With enough flux on the traces, the copper surface will literally absorb the solder. So if you put a drop of solder on the tip of your iron and move it along the traces, the solder will magically find its way towards the traces. The narrower the space between the traces, the less solder you have to put on your iron tip to avoid bridges between the traces. Ok, time to put back the connectors.
I don't show it every time, but after every soldering, never forget to clean the PCB with some alcohol. Plugs can be conductive and aggressive on the surface. It can damage the PCB over longer periods of time. As you see, the tinned traces on the back also look quite nice and shiny. Now it's time to prepare the board for the first test. Let's insert the CPU. The 486 CPUs are not safe from polarity reversal, so always look twice how you insert it into the socket. The CPU has this cut corner. And the socket has such a marker on one corner as well. These corners of the socket and the CPU must match. Well, as I wanted to insert the AT power connector, I found one problem. Wolf said that he replaced the keyboard port. It is new, so I didn't bother to replace it again. However, it seems not to fit well. If I try to push the AT power plug into the connector, it doesn't go completely down. This is because there is this latch, which is pushing against the base of the keyboard connector. I could cut off the latch on the power plug, but I would prefer to make it properly and will have to replace the connector by this one. As you see, it has no plastic borders going around the base, so the latch of the power connector would just pass beside the pins. Okay, everything's connected. I've been told that this mainboard posts, so let's give it a try. Seems to wake up. It complains about empty battery and missing controller, but it's just fine, I didn't plug any into the board. However, it also complains about missing keyboard. So far, everything seems to be just as Ulf described previously. Keyboard errors are very common on old PCs, so let's take a closer look on how it works. On an AT machine, a special controller is responsible for the keyboard input. It is such a big 40-pin IC. There are plenty of different variants of it in the wild, but they are all derived from Intel's 8042 chip originally used in the IBM's PC-80. Keyboard connector is DIN5 Type 1. It has 5 pins, where pin 1 is clock, Pin 2 is data, pin 3 is usually unused, pin 4 is ground, and pin 5 is plus 5 volt power supply. I will not go into details now, but the keyboard uses a protocol on the clock and data pins to communicate with the PC. If you are interested in the protocol itself and further details, please watch the exciting video by Ben Ether about it. I will put the link down into the description. So regardless of the protocol details, as I said, the keyboard is connected to the keyboard controller, the big 40 pin IC. The clock is connected to the pin 1 of the IC and the data is connected to the pin 39. Sometimes the connections are not direct, but are going through inductors or a pair of inverters for filtering and stabilization purposes. But basically speaking, there must be a connection from pin 1 of the keyboard port to pin 1 of the keyboard controller and from the pin 2 of the keyboard port to the pin 39 of the keyboard controller. Furthermore, you always have to check that you have plus 5 volt supply on the pin 5 of the keyboard port. Usually it is sufficient to look at the keyboard lamps when you turn on the power. If they light up for a moment, that means that the power is probably provided. If not sure, you can still measure it directly on the port using a multimeter. On this mainboard the keyboard gets powered, so everything's fine in that regard. So let's check what happens with clock and data. This is pin 39 of the keyboard controller, and it is connected to the inductor L4 down here. The pin 1 of the keyboard connector is connected to the inductor L3, so the clock signal should go from the keyboard port to the controller through L3 and the data through L4. Let's see on the back side if we have continuity between the keyboard port and these inductors. So this is pin 1 of the keyboard port and it is used for clock. As you hear, we have continuity on this trace. Now this is data trace on pin 2. Let's see what we get here. There is obviously no continuity. I'll touch the trace and slide up towards the keyboard connector along it. Aha, uh -huh, you see? Here we have a continuity and somewhere from this point it disappears. We have a broken trace. It is barely visible even under magnification, but it is somewhere here. I will again use the same technique as in the last video. A lot of flux and a wire, which I will solder on top of the trace. I see multiple potential cracks in this trace, so I will solder a longer wire. In such case, it is easier to solder it on one side first, holding with a finger from the other one, 
and then straighten the wire and solder the other side. Short continuation test looks good. As I showed in my last video, I covered the soldered wire with some nail polish to give it additional protection as well. Everything's built up again, let's give it one more try. And as you can see, we have only battery error, because I didn't install one. However, an IDE controller with a compact flash is already inserted and the keyboard should now work. And it does indeed. Let me make some settings and try to boot into DOS. And here we are, DOS did boot, let's see what Season 4 says. 486DX, 80MHz, 16MB RAM seems to be detected properly. Benchmark says 172 points, which are not bad at all. I'd be curious to know how this board behaves when overclocked, but it would be a topic out of scope of this video. Yeah, Doom is running as well, and I'd say this was another successful repair. I'm getting a lot of repair requests from many people, but I encourage everybody to trust yourself and to give it a try. Unfortunately, one person can't repair everything, but I hope my videos will help you to spot and fix the issues with your hardware and bring it back from the dead. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to give your feedback, thumbs up, down, share it, all the usual stuff. And I say thank you and goodbye.